you ever wanted to make a movie? Thanks to technology, anyone can make a movie today. Filmmaking has become the new garage band. Welcome to Frame Lines, the show about people making movies. Frame Lines is brought to you in part by Sabo Studios, gear for the show. Tape Central, providing your media needs. Production Partners Media, affordable media solutions. And by grants from the Greater Columbus Arts Council and the Ohio Arts Council. The Director of Photography, also known as the DP or DOP. The DP is someone who is responsible for the process of photographing a scene in the manner desired by the director. The Director of Photography has a number of possible duties. Selection of film stock, cameras and lenses, designing and selecting lighting, directing the gaffer's placement of lighting, shot composition in consultation with the director, film developing and film printing. On larger shoots, the DP often does not even touch the camera, and that job is done by a camera operator. The difference between a cinematographer and a director of photography depends on the situation. The most common distinction is that a cinematographer is a director of photography that operates his own camera, but that isn't always true. Today we're going to be talking about shooting chase scenes. The two most essential things in shooting any chase scene are coverage and sound. Basically, when you're doing a chase scene, if you really only had one angle to work with, it would be fairly boring. Having multiple angles, pre-planning to shoot a lot of angles such as close-up of the hand on the steering wheel, uh, close-up of the speedometer, close-up of the tire spinning, a wide shot of the car, uh, switch to another angle, a wide shot of the car as it pulls away. Uh, all these kind of shot variations are the type of thing that will make a chase scene a lot more interesting. Psychologically, you will affect the viewer by having more angles to look at and showing them more shots in a faster order will make it a lot more tense. Shooting in order when you deal with action scenes is completely impractical and is not the most efficient way of making a scene. When shooting an action scene, you'll tend to want to shoot all the different types of shots together. Uh, like you want to shoot all the exteriors at a time, then shoot all the interiors at the same time, and it doesn't matter what order you cut them in. Things like in the example of our car chase scene, the last thing we shot was the speedometer, which was shot on the highway hours after the shoot downtown. They say that sound is 50% of the experience. Never is that more true than in an action scene. When dealing with an action scene, you can vary the sound and that increases the tension. It affects everything about how the viewer feels about the scene just as much as the visual images. In most cases when dealing with an action scene, you will create virtually all of the sound effects in post-production. As I did in this scene, every single sound you hear was created in post-production from the sound effects library. Your tools to making an action scene more dynamic are shot variety and coverage, editing at a faster pace, and then the sound effects and music that will glue the edit together. The dream of every indie filmmaker is to get their feature into Sundance, get a million dollar deal, hang out with Harvey Weinstein and land a three picture deal at a studio. Here's why even with a million dollar deal, you may not want to quit your day job. The Blair Witch Project from 1999 represents the model we all aspire to. It was a low budget movie that sold for a million dollars to Artists on Pictures with a killer screening at the Sundance Film Festival. Here's some approximate numbers we can work from. $35,000 budget and cash, but total with $60,000 with deferments. Deferments are for the people who worked on the movie during the shoot, but if you turn a profit, you owe them their salaries. So a million dollars minus $60,000 is 940,000. 
That still seems like a million dollars. You can round up from that. Now the deal with the investors is that 50% goes to producers and 50% goes to the investors of the net profits. So that's 940,000 cut in half. Whoa, $470,000, that's already less than half a million dollars. There were two producer directors on the film, so cut that in half too, $235,000. Okay, now you're gonna be in the highest tax bracket there is, which is 39.6%. That leaves you with a whopping $141,940. That's still a pretty sizable amount of money, but when people hear or dream of a million dollar deal, what it really winds up with is $141,940. And that's if there's only two producers sharing profit points on the movie. I'm not saying not to dream big, I'm saying dream smart and think. Okay, further on, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what are things you've either done or seen that it's kind of like, think of it more like this way. What would you say, if looking back, if you could have been an advisor now to yourself as a first, <laughs> on your first directing, what would you, what would you tell yourself? What is it that maybe you did that was the most kind of, the thing you thought was kind of the worst offense you might have done that you would want to see undone if you could do that? Wore too many hats. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was behind the camera, in front of the camera, and uh, my co-stars have to tell me sometimes, okay, take that behind the camera scene hat off, get get in front of the camera, and get that first one, get in, get in character, those type of things. So I, the second time around, it was a lot easier. I slashed down my uh, my role some, but I enjoyed doing both, really, but I think I think it um, hurt the project just a little bit if you're not experienced, because I wasn't experienced at doing it. I mean, I was new at everything, except for the acting part. So the big thing for you was really being an actor in the scene, it, that really ripped you, it, it was tearing your concentration apart, you think? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. I'm worried about, okay, I hope they, they got this right, okay, are they doing this? All right, stop, did y'all did have that, okay, you know, those type of thing, how the shot look. And uh, so just too many hats in the beginning. I just feel like a lot of times people try to bite off more than they can chew, and then, then you just get yourself in trouble. Like, well, what's an example of that? Or just like even, even my, my, the first 40 hour that we did, we were like, oh, we're gonna do this and this and this and this. And, and it was like eight o'clock Saturday night and we're like, <laughs> our actors had to go. <laughs> it, was, it was just that, we, we ended up pulling it together, but it was, it was a, definitely a, a learning experience. So like experience. what percentage of what you intended did you actually get done then? Uh, like probably like 45%. <laughs> So, so like, like, we just keep it short and sweet, I think, yeah. Yeah, and concentrate on the script. It's all, with, you know, starts with the script. Keep it short and sweet. Know what you can do and concentrate on doing that well as opposed to this grand idea that you have. I'm a big proponent for, but I don't disrespect people that go straight for features. Mm -hmm. But I'm a big believer in, like, you do shorts and kind of graduate to features. I probably would have done that had I known better. Well, for me, it's more of, like, you know, you learn to write a sentence before you write a novel in a lot of ways, so you learn how to write a st sentence structure before you really try to tackle right. a novel. But at the same time, there are people that are like, what good is a short? There's people that feel that way, and I don't disrespect it. Even if right. I disagree with it, I don't disrespect that opinion. Yeah, but I think my, my thing was, um, I didn't write a short story first, I wrote a novel. Mm -hmm. I didn't write a, a short movie or a short, I wrote a feature. And so because I was looking to try to maybe uh, option it somehow or another, and it, it never got to that point. Like, hey, shoot it yourself. So I got some people, like I said before, Craig Short, John Whitley, some other people, and they helped but, me get started. But do you regret doing a feature before you did a short? I think um, I think I spent a lot of money on and not having the quality that I wanted. So in that regard, yes. But overall, I still don't have any regrets. You know, because I still love it. I loved I love what what um, the finished product. But I think. Quality-wise, it, it suffered a lot of ways. Uh, well, what, what what did you find in terms of editing? Hmm. What did you really learn more as you went between editing from where you started and to where where you are now? Uh, when you think it's there, keep cutting. <laughs> That's I, I just feel like it can always be cut. You're so afraid, especially if you're editing it yourself. Oh, you know, this is my baby. I don't want to cut it down. You're so attached to the scenes, but now you just gotta. Cut the fat. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I learned on the job training again as with everything in the first movie. So 
as I watched the editor edit, I just learned everything I could. And so when I shot the second one, I shot with the editor in mind. Mm -hmm. And so that helped me out a lot. So I went in and edited primarily most of it myself the second time. So, so confident was, I was confident that time. So in the first one, when you first movie, when you worked mm -hmm. with an editor, mm -hmm. Did you find that they maybe wanted to cut lines or something that you really wanted to keep? Did you ever have oh, those absolutely. kind of conversations? Yeah, yeah. We, we almost went to blows a couple times. <laughs> well, that's, that's <laughs> actually good room, that you right? almost did because yeah. if you're, the best thing about that is you have a collaborator that's passionate about their opinions too. Right, right. And I had and to you, respect that. And that's the thing about it is that that fight, whether it came to blows or not, <laughs> could determine making the best movie possible. Oh, I, it's just an interesting, you, you bringing up being, it being collaborative. It is, and yet... Mostly, I think one person owns the vision. Would you call it the director or the producer? Right. Good question. <laughs> I try to be both. That way, Whoever I solve had the that money. problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to have the person, right? I don't know. What, who, I don't know if there's a right person, place to yeah. put it, but you, I mean, it could be the, it could be the editor. I, but it has to be somebody. I think most people are writer producers that think that they're writer directors. Because a lot of the things that people do in making indie films today, when you say indie film, I'm talking about like these DSLR or camcorder shoots. Most people are writer producers that think they're writer directors. Because director and a film by credit is the sexy title, that's yeah. what everybody wants, but they don't understand is what they're actually doing is producing and not directing. Because, I mean, the art form of directing, and, I mean, and I'm, by the way, I'm talking about myself more than anybody else, because that's what I was. For the first seven or eight years of my filmmaking career, I was a writer-producer that thought he was a writer-director. So as angry as I may sound about other people, I'm really talking about myself, quite genuinely. And it's like, I'm only, I'm still very much learning what the art form of directing is. I mean, like, what is directing to you? I mean, I think it's just, I think it's different with everybody. Because, I mean, for me personally, when we're on set, I'm just like totally relaxed and I, I let the actors kind of do their thing. I'm, I'm not like overly do it this way, do it this way. I just kind of like trust the actors and let them do their thing. That's, I mean, that's at least, that's, that's how but I am. What you, but again, it's more of what is the definition of directing to you? Like what does that entail? What are your responsibilities as a director? I mean, getting the best out of your talent. It's one of the things where you're just trying to get... I don't know. I'm like him, man. I'm, I'm all about the talent because I heard a guy say sometimes, man, you let the actors do what they do. I just direct the, the shots and I direct everything else. Um, just, I don't know. You, you but is that, what, out, is that my, your view too? That like you're more interested in more, the I'm more the actors. I'm more, I'm more actors. I like to lead the camera to the cameraman. We discuss what I, what, what I see. Then if he, can, if he can do it, get the shot I want, then that's on him. But I'm more with the actors. I wonder where you land on that. I, you know, I, I, I've had some conversations with people who say they're really aggravated by line reads. You know, don't give me a line read. I'm talented. I know how to do it. Um, and I totally and I appreciate that. I wonder about the structure of a short versus a feature, and the assembly of the story, and its sequencing, and how much, I guess you'd call it, control is required to get to the payoff in four minutes versus. I mean, I what I want to do more of is letting the um, the actors act. I j I'm curious. I need to learn more about the structure. But sorry, your question was um, <laughs> definition of director. I think I think directors' responsibilities are to um, own the vision for the for the product, own own the own the heart of the vision of the product. Uh, be a great team great team leader who gets people aligned with the vision. And I think it's smart what Vic said about get the best out of your talent. That could look different. Talent yeah. covers in front of the camera and behind the camera. Yeah. Well, on your features, what was like your biggest day with the most people? And how many, how many people did you have to wrangle? Crew, probably about eight. Really? That's yeah. the largest your crew got? Yeah, and the smallest was maybe three. <laughs> so you always had your camera and your sound covered, right? Oh, yeah, tried to. <laughs> What's the average size of your crew then? Uh, it's, you know, same thing. Ranges from two or three or four people to, you know, big day, 15. This wraps up kind of the roundtable for first-time filmmaker advice. I want to thank everybody for coming. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Thank you.
After I graduated college, I was really looking for an internship, and I wound up here with Sunny Boo. What separates the Sunny Boo internship from other internships is we try to prepare our interns for what life is going to be like in the real filmmaking situations. There are challenges every day. Uh... Ross! Ross, I can't see in the dark! Our internship is pretty aggressive. We prefer to train our interns to be ready for anything at any time. Well, I, uh, I come in every morning and I usually start digitizing. Hey! We're very proud of our internship at Sunny Boo. Only about one in ten survive. Depth of field is something all filmmakers should be aware of. It's the area of your shot that's going to be in focus, and it's affected by several choices, your lenses, your lighting, and your blocking. First, what is depth of field? It is the area in your shot that is in focus. Now, technically, there's only one true area of focus in the shot. It's like, you know, my plane of my eyes. But because our eyes and lenses can perceive certain ranges of focus, it can range from three feet in front of me to six feet behind me. Depth of field is broken into thirds. So if you have nine feet in your depth of field, it'll be three feet in front of the subject, like in front of me, and six feet behind. So you know you could put an actor over my shoulder, they'll be in focus. But if they're clear at the wall back there, they're not gonna be in focus. What are some of the factors that affect depth of field? Lens choice, or the focal length of your lens, is going to affect depth of field greatly. A long lens, a telephoto lens, will have less depth of field than a wide angle lens, like the one we're using now. And that's because of the wider angle of view. Here we have a shot of our subject with a wide angle lens, and you'll see that the objects in the foreground and background, including the subject, are in focus. When we zoom in or switch to a longer focal length lens, or telephoto lens, we'll see that the foreground and background elements are out of focus. This is showing your depth of field is being limited. All lenses have an aperture, which can open and close to get a proper exposure for your image. And it's kind of a backwards world where the smaller the number, the bigger the opening, and the larger the number, the smaller the opening. It's really an inverse thing. It's 16 over one or two over one. So how does this affect depth of field? Well, when you're wide open, it's a big hole, and it means the light is scattered, and it's harder to focus it down on your film plane or sensor. Where if you make the hole smaller, the light is more focused on the sensor, and there it can focus a lot easier and give you more depth of field. Another factor is light level. And pure and simple, this means the more light you have, the bigger depth of field you'll have. If you're lighting in low light levels, you're gonna have less depth of field because, again, you're gonna to have to open up the aperture of the camera and your depth of field will plummet. So that's the reason if you want less depth of field, you drop the light level. And you can do this by taking lights away or adding an ND filter to your camera, which is a neutral density filter, which lessens the light reaching your image. The final factor is the size of your imaging sensor or film gate. Uh, the bigger the sensor or gate, the harder it is to, again, focus the light down. So you're going to have less depth of field. And that's the reason people today are going with these larger sensor cameras like DSLRs, is that it matches a 35 millimeter film frame and your depth of field is less. Where if you're shooting a, uh, a smaller handheld camera or like your phone, the sensor could be as big as your pinky or smaller. And the smaller that is, the easier it is to focus the light down, and ergo, you have more depth of field. When we talk deep focus, that means everything in the shot is in focus. And when we talk shallow focus, that means only a select area is in focus. And the reason you want to go with shallow focus is you want the audience to focus on that specific element. And if you want deep focus, then you want to show the grandeur of your shot. Depth of field is an incredibly powerful tool in filmmaking to make the audience focus on what you want them to see. So use it to tell the stories you want to tell. You want to know what bothers me? Bad cliches in movies. 
You know, the completely unrealistic and annoying parts where we, the audience, think that doesn't work like that. Like this. Don't you hate it when extras in a movie or TV show aren't allowed to talk? Like on Star Trek when the captain talks to a crew member. Ensign, take this to engineering. Can I get a yes, Captain? This is the military, you know. Do you speak? Well then, say something. You realize I could have you killed. 300 people on this ship and I can only get six to talk to me. Carry on. The reason movies and TV shows do this is because of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild rules. If someone opens their mouth and says a single word, their pay goes from $148 a day to over a thousand bucks a day and you'd have to pay residuals. So movies do unrealistic things to save a few bucks. You know, I made it with a green alien once, right? Does that impress you? No. Well. The assistant camera, aka assistant camera operator, first assistant cameraman, and camera assistant. The assistant cameraman is a member of the camera crew who assists the camera operator. This person is responsible for the maintenance and care of the camera, placing it where the DP wants in between shots, etc. In smaller camera crews, they may also perform the duties of clapper loader and or a focus puller. The clapper loader is a crew member who loads film or tape into the camera. On film, this person loads film negative into the magazines and unloads exposed film for processing. On a video shoot, this is now for loading and unloading tapes or dealing with copying footage from hard drives or data cards like P2 or Compact Flash or SD. They are also responsible for slating with the clapper. The focus puller is the person in the camera department that adjusts the focal length on the lens during a shoot for the camera operator. This job often entails making sure the focus plane is correct when shifting focus from one subject to another. Like all departments on set, the smaller the shoot, many of these jobs get combined into fewer people. Oftentimes, a DP is his own focus puller or an assistant cameraman loads and slates, etc. Hello. I'm Peter John Ross, the writer-director of the Cell Phone Monologues. Hey, honey, it's me. I just got off work a little early and I wanted to see what you wanted to do about dinner. We never get to see each other anymore since you got your promotion. I know I've not been in the best of moods here the past few months. I'm just in a funk, you know? I just don't want you to think that this is the beginning of a pattern, but the end of one, you know? I have not been acting depressed all the time, just some of the time. But you have to realize that this is just the first step. No, I know you've been telling me for weeks that I've been grumpy, but I... I know I have not gone with you to your mother's and Todd's house in over two months, but that is because he's a smoker and she hates me. Yes, she does! What does that mean, I should have gone anyway? I... How... How do... <laughs> how is that supporting you? How is being called a liberal and then being constantly compared to your ex-boyfriend by your mother, how is that supporting you? I mean, tell me. How is that supporting you? Am I an idiot? That's insane! All right. Fine. All I wanted to do was to go out and have a bite to eat. I just wanted to do something special, you know? Just us. You're working late. No, no, no. With your new job comes new responsibilities. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about it then. Yeah, I'll see you about nine. All right. Bye.
first cell phone monologue features actor Ralph Scott, who I'd seen in several other movies but hadn't had the chance to work with. So this was just a great chance for us to work on this piece. And we walked around downtown. I knew I was gonna do an editorial choice where it was gonna be jump cuts and Teresa Jacob was the editor on this and she kind of found the style I wanted on, on this editorially. So it was a bit of a jump cut. So you get the sense that you're getting a much larger conversation than what you're seeing. You're only seeing pieces of it. I'm a real stickler about certain details and I noticed in one of these shots that I had the license plate, the real license plate. So I motion tracked the license plate, added an additional lens flare to help kind of blend it in when the headlights turn off and on. It's becoming kind of a joke with me that all license plates say Sunny Boo, the name of my company on them. When I originally did this shoot, I could not find a bar that would suffice for kind of this pseudo surprise ending. I needed to be able to look through a, a large glass window into a bar. So what I wanted to do was I thought, well, I can just pick that shot up later and I'll get that actor back. Seven months went by before I did the second cell phone monologue inside of the movie theater, Studio 35. Uh, I looked at a tutorial on the website videocopilot.net with Andrew Kramer where he had done a car window that was completely CGI. And I decided, I think I can apply this to doing a bar window. So I created a, a window with something that, like a dirty layer that looked like a sheet of glass. In Photoshop, I made the name of the bar, which is Uncle Pete's Bar, a nod to one of my other short films. I uh, took a handheld shot of the actor, Ralph Scott on the street and stabilized it and composited it into the window. Then we passed through the window and into the bar we went that was actually inside of a movie theater. But with sound effects and that move, you get the sense that, you know, it's actually inside a real bar. I completed the shot seven months later through just this combination of post-production exercises. Mm -hmm.